This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kara Ruda on the show with me. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called The Next Wife. And I'll tell you what, if you love psychological suspense and thrillers, this is going to be right in your wheelhouse. Uh, you know, This is a must-have in your your spring uh, to be red pile, and it needs to be sitting. Uh, I would say next to your reading chair in the living room, where you can li- read with plenty of light on, because y- this, um, y- you don't necessarily want this right beside the bed, and the the last thing that you read before going to sleep at night. I'll just put it that way. Um, I I absolutely love the book, and I'm telling everyone about it. Uh, welcome to the show, Kara. Uh, thanks so much, Hank. I know the cover is a little creepy too. <laughs> Looking up next to her might be crazy. <laughs> oh, it, Kara, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Yeah, that's an easy one. I remember in third grade, my teacher gave us the assignment to write to the person you wanted to be when you grow up. And so I wrote a letter to Robert McCloskey of Make Way for Ducklings fame and Blueberries for Sal. And I said, dear Mr. McCloskey, I want to be just like you when I grow up. And he wrote me back and said, well, you made a bad choice because I'm an illustrator, not an author, but good luck to you. (laughs) <laughs> so thus began my illustrious writing career, <laughs> writing to the wrong person. But anyway, seriously, I knew from then and and even in um, fifth grade, my elementary school guard, Mrs. Gardier um, librarian, she laminated a story that I wrote about Scooter and Skipper, these twin boys, and she put it in the shelf and it had a call number and everything. You could check it out. And that was just solidified everything for me. I love that. Um at what point, Kara, do you do you remember realizing that people wrote books? And and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're when you're a little kid, it seems like books are just almost ethereal. They just kind of show up out of nowhere. Uh, and but then there's there's a realization that happens that there are people behind these stories and that uh, a person wrote this book. And in, in, in your case, were Blueberries for Sale, someone illustrated it as well. And then there's you know, a whole industry in publishing that that helps to, you know, get the book ready and then prints it and then, you know, booksellers and and there there are people behind these stories. Do, do you remember having that realization? Well, I had an interesting upbringing because my dad was a marketing professor um, for an MBA level. And so he was always published. So we always had his books around and um, books were just kind of part, he was either always writing a book, working on a book or, you know, so I, I knew right. that my dad was part of that whole thing, not in the uh, fiction world, but in the nonfiction. And so I, I guess it was just kind of natural to me that people did that, that that was just what you did. If you wanted your words out in the world, you would jump in and there were people behind them doing that. Oh, that is fantastic. Did, did you, do you feel like that you got some of your, uh, storytelling gift or your communication gift, um, from him? 
Oh, for sure. Yeah. He's a big storyteller and uh, just kind of always was able to captivate a room. And he was the first person to go to uh, college and his whole family and like was so proud of education and learning and teaching and being able to, you know, instill, I guess, through story pretty much the love of learning in other people. And, and yeah. So, I mean, you know, in marketing, there's case studies that you write and those are telling stories about how a business does good or bad in the world. And he was always also about um, business and the corporate social challenge and how businesses could be involved in their community. So there's a lot of stories there as well. That's fantastic. Um, Kara, so uh, as someone who, you know, just always knew that you wanted to tell stories and, and wanted to connect with people in this way, um, what was the path that, that you chose? Uh, you know, a lot of times people, um, you know, have these dreams, but then there's, you uh, you know, the, the importance of, of, uh, you know, getting out on your own, paying your own bills, raising a family, <laughs> all of that sort of thing. And then storytelling kind of comes back around, but what, what was, what's your story to, uh, y- your path that you chose? Yeah, that's my path. So, <laughs> yeah, but, um, I was an English major in college and, uh, loved that. I loved, learning English literature, especially Southern Lit. I went to Vanderbilt and, oh my goodness, uh, had the best Southern professors who would just read Southern Lit and then just having the words spoken that way. So beautiful. Anyway, and then I, but I was, I never wrote with a byline in college or, and then, but I, I wanted to do that. And so then I needed to make money graduating. And so I fluctuated between journalism jobs and um, marketing jobs. So I was like an advertising copywriter and then I also freelance journals. And I found that I loved writing magazine stories because they were a longer format and you could tell people's stories more fully than you could in newspapers. So I was always freelancing magazines while I was kind of working on my, my way up in the marketing career world, world to pay the bills. And then what happened was my husband and I started a business together and we launched a brand. And by that time I'd run uh, branding for some big companies. And so I kind of took over that side of the world and we did that for about 10 years. And I wrote a book based on that experience for women entrepreneurs. And I started going around the country telling women it's time. It's up to you to live the life of your dreams and put your passions into action. And I looked at myself and I'm like, self you've always wanted to write a novel and you're not doing what you're telling everyone else to do so that's when I finally sat down to write and that was about 12 years ago well that that's uh th- those are some uh some challenging times when you realize that uh the advice that you're giving everyone else that you're not necessarily taking um right. that that can cause a lot of introspection and uh and you know, um, some people may not come away from that kind of self conversation with the determination to to push forward. Uh, what, what was what, what was that that moment of of uh, of kind of challenging yourself? What was that like? Yeah, you know, uh, for me it was pretty exciting. I mean, at first it was scary. We had sold the company, so all of a sudden I didn't have a hundred employees to manage. I didn't have anybody asking me to like. I didn't really have anything all of a sudden, and I was still going around the country talking. To, to women, predominantly entrepreneurs, but uh, I, and we had moved out to California at this point too. So, and all my kids were in school. So I'm sitting there with this desk and my laptop and I'm like, you know, this is, this is when you, you know, you've got to do what you've been telling people to do, but also what you've always wanted to do yourself. So I'd say in a sense, it was, I, I mean, really empowering. <laughs> I mean, daunting, but also empowering and really fun too. So what was that first idea, Kara, of, uh, you know, I, I've, I've told people to follow their dream. I'm not doing it myself. Now I'm going to I'm, I'm going to strike out and do it. What was that first book idea that you had? Well, interestingly, um, I always kind of had like a darker take on the world, kind of like where <laughs> I find myself now in the domestic suspense world. But based on my first nonfiction book, which was called Real You Incorporated, Eight Essentials for Women Entrepreneurs, my agent wanted me to do a women's fiction book that had the same kind of advice, only in a fictionalized format. So that's what I did. So my first novel is called Here Home Hope. And in it, the protagonist, Kelly, she has a things to change list in her life. And as she goes through the story, which is a story, it's about friendship, it's about growth, and it's kind of midlife crisis oriented. 
she makes us things to change list and they're very similar um, ideas and kind of um, inspiration as you'd find in my nonfiction book. So that's kind of how we tied them together. So that was my first, my first novel, but it also had a very big nod to my nonfiction book. Well, that's that's really interesting that you uh, create this hybrid of uh, things that that you definitely want to tell people, like like that you would do in a nonfiction book, but couching it in fiction. Do do you feel right. like that 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 um, it just seems to me like um, like that would open all sorts of possibilities to to merge those two things. Yeah, it was really fun, actually, because when you when you allow yourself to create characters and story, and I've always been a pantser, which means you write by the seat of your pants, of course. And so sure. my characters kind of came to life as I wrote, which was a great gift I, I found, especially with my first novel, to just be able to have that. And then the stories that I told people in my nonfiction book were naturally acted out by my protagonist, if that makes sense. <laughs> so she would find herself in many of the situations that all of my women entrepreneurs I was speaking to around the country were in, you know, how do you balance work and life and (laughs) kids and, you know, husbands and all that stuff. How do you make time for you when you're giving everything to start a business and a family and, you know, all those kind of notions. So it it actually, it was pretty easy and pretty fun too. So you've said that you, you, uh, you know, always had a draw to sort of these darker sort of stories, the the psychological suspense. Um, is has that always been true? Have you always been a, a lover of suspenseful stories, mystery okay. stories? Do, do do you remember what the first mystery was that just really kind of opened you up to the possibilities that you could do with this kind of story? Well, I mean, I was always a big fan of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, and I. I remember reading those, but then I think it was, um, is it V.C. Andrews? Yes. Yeah, okay. Those books are the ones that started, like, really kind of making me realize. And at the same time, I I loved the detective series, like um, Kenzie Malone and all of that as well. So I think they all kind of blended together, and then I loved Murder, She Wrote on television. (laughs) So, So many ways to kind of... They're all, in a way, to me, articulating what's percolating right below the surface of perfectly seeming lives, right? That we're all trying to act normal when there is no real such thing and keeping up with the Joneses. And that always, always fascinated me. You have – I read something. It's probably on your website now that uh, I'm thinking about it where you talked about the importance of defining your brand. Um, For someone who wrote – you know, hybrid nonfiction and fiction with the uh, motivational um, uh, type type uh, information, and then um, all the work that you've done in marketing and 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 all of that to then go over to um, suspense books. Um, you know, um, what does that mean for your brand, and and how do you um, kind of set yourself apart in in those two kind of wildly different genres? Well, you know, even from the beginning, Here Home Hope is set in the suburbs, and I'm a product of the suburbs and the good and the bad of the suburbs. So I tend to always set my stories there. And as I said, you know, Here Home Hope is very uplifting at the end. It has a a very positive message. And then from there, things got darker. (laughs) But I, I think it's all about what's beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives. That's where that's where my kind of imagination runs wild and people pretending to be stuff that they aren't and, you know, hiding like secrets that can live right beneath perfectly manicured lawns and seemingly people. And I like to say people who don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from can start worrying about the curtains and what color they are and what, you know, the the things that mean much (laughs) in the bigger picture of life so my characters maybe find themselves struggling with those kind of issues as well so um, anyway that's kind of where I sit and I think it all does come from the same place I mean like I said Here Home Hope is set in a fictional suburb of Columbus Ohio I like to call Grandville but there really isn't a place called Grandville but I grew up a lot I spent a lot of time my kids grew up in Upper Arlington Ohio so that's where that's set and then now that we've lived in California for 12 years uh, there's a lot of similar fodder here (laughs) you know I I think there's a lot of similarities but 
people will say if they read a book from a suburb of Dallas, oh, did you set that here? I feel like you know my suburb. So there's a lot of similar themes that run through American suburbs. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting, and we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Was it when you decided that you wanted to write suspense um, after having kind of planted your flag uh, in in the other genre? What was that a a difficult thing to to kind of venture out? You know, when, once you've sort of done something and had uh, you know a, a modicum of success with it, uh, you know it it becomes harder to try something new and to branch out. Um, how, how did how did you decide to do that? You're supposed to stay in your swim lane, eh? <laughs> I know. But, <laughs> you know, it's like in every business, you, there's uh, you, you're going to lose some people along the way. So I've been since I've been blessed to start doing the career that I've always wanted to do since third grade to um, take challenges. So. Uh, you know, I was writing women's fiction and having a, I will say though, my women's fiction were getting darker and darker too. Goodbye years, my last classic women's fiction. And it's pretty dark. <laughs> there's some, there's some bad stuff that happens. But while, while I was writing the goodbye year, one of my friends had just started a romance uh, publishing company. And she's like, have you ever tried romance? I'm like, no, I haven't. So I spent two years writing romance and I really learned a lot. I learned that in actuality, it's a very empowering genre for women. It's a lot of women are writing romance. That was an area where they could go and kind of dominate the genre and earn a lot of money and respect. And so anyway, I learned a lot in my two years of romance, which I guess you weren't supposed to do <laughs> that. And then all of a sudden I was back to women's fiction. I was writing a manuscript um, and this character, Paul of best day ever hopped into my head and he wouldn't let go. So while my agent was reviewing my manuscript for my women's fiction, I wrote the best day ever draft and <laughs> I sent it to my beta reader and she's like, Oh my gosh, this is so creepy and so good. Send it to your agent. So I sent it to my agent. And she's like, no, you write women's fiction. You can't write this. Mm. I'm not going to read it to your point. <laughs> and I said, well, shoot, no, I don't think that's just what I write. <laughs> I've been in romance. I've been in women's fiction. And now I'd really like to write this. And I didn't realize at the time it was called domestic suspense. And so she finally agreed with more nudging and prodding and saying, I might have to find somebody else to read it. And she was out in New York. And so when I woke up the next morning, she'd stayed all night, up all night reading it and loved it. So she agreed to go to, to market with it, which was great. And so that's, you know, it just, it, I think you have to write what you want to write, even yeah. if it might not be what you're supposed to be writing at the time, but if it's good and you're passionate about it and you stand behind it, you can find an audience for it. Did, did you, speaking of finding an audience, did, did you start getting feedback from, from readers and, and what sort of, 
uh, encouragement did you get from them that let you know that you were, you know, not just branching out of your lane and and, and actually doing something that was fulfilling to you, but also connecting with readers? Yeah, let's see. Best day ever was just the best because it was um, I, I you know, sold it. Or my agent sold it to a new uh, to Harlequin and they called one day and said, oh, we're starting a new imprint and you're going to lead the imprint. Didn't even know, really know what that meant. I'm like, awesome. And then they called another day and said, oh, and we're going to launch you in hardcover. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. It's like a dream come true. Not really knowing what that meant. And then I mean, it was just a great uh, first kind of way to step into domestic suspense. I went to the Javits Center for BA and I walked in and there was a banner like, I don't know how many stories tall with the book cover on it. I'm like, okay, this is really awesome. And that whole thing was just a, a, an amazing journey of like, I don't know, um, that you get once in a lifetime, <laughs> I'm sure. But that said, it exposed me to so many readers that were already familiar with the domestic suspense genre. And what I've learned is, similar to women's fiction, if your characters, and I write characters that are unreliable and quite nasty at times, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but in, in those stories, I also hopefully um, raise issues or, or shed light on the good that can happen too. So in Best Day Ever, it's a story about a husband and wife and the husband's taking his wife away for to, up to their lake house in Ohio and promises that the day will the, the weekend will start with her best day ever. And he has ulterior motives, obviously, because it's domestic suspense. But I've received a lot of letters from readers who said, they'll write to me women will, who will say, um, April 7th was my best day ever. Thank you for inspiring me, you know. So like things like that are really powerful that that a work of fiction can help someone see what their partner really is and, and get the strength to get away from them. So anyway, right. Um, Carrie, you said that that you're a pantser, and uh, I, I love to ask people if they're pantsers or plotters or some, you know, hybrid of the two somewhere in between. Um, but since you are a pantser and you like to follow the story where it's going, uh, at, you know, as you write it, um, how does a how does a story begin for you? I, I love to hear about the beginnings of things. You know, one moment the next wife doesn't exist in any form or fashion. There, there's nothing to it. But then a character walks on the stage of your mind or you you think of a, a scenario, some plot point of, you know, ooh, what if someone did this or that? And then the what if game starts playing. And then in some fashion, um, the next wife exists. It, it you know, it, it of course, you have to write it and edit it and all that. But the story lives at some point. What, what is that first kernel that uh, that kind of erupts into the story. Yeah, usually for me, it's it's to your point, it's a character, and usually pretty powerfully comes into my brain. So in the next wife, Kate was the person that jumped into my head first, and she, Kate Nelson, she's the first wife, and also the title. And so my original title for this was the second wife, and then somebody released a book, <laughs> the second wife. <laughs> And so they change it to the next wife, and then somebody released a book with the next wife as a title right before mine. So it doesn't really matter. So it, that's usually what comes into my mind is the title and the first character. And then it's just exciting because she, in this case, Kate, is kind of the anchor of the story in my mind. But hopefully you're not sure where whether she's good or bad, reliable or unreliable. But that's that's where the fun kind of starts. Love it. So, so tell us a little bit about the book. Um, you, you had this idea, the, the second wife or the next wife. Um, what were, what were some of the things that were tied up with that? Um, you know, you've, you've talked about suburban life and, and all of the, um, the, the good and the bad that goes with, with that term. Um, w was this kind of based on, on other people that you had watched, other situations, families nearby, or kind of what was the, the catalyst that kicked this off? In this case, in particular, um, like I spoke about, my husband and I ran a business together <laughs> for 10 years. It's called Real Living Real Estate. And so there's a lot of, um, what should we say, fodder in that. <laughs> so um, in this story, Kate and John Nelson are married and Kate has an idea for a business and they um, get it up and running and it's successful beyond their wildest dreams. And they have a daughter, Ashlyn, along the way and everything is going swimmingly well as far as Kate's concerned. 
concerned and till John hires a new executive assistant named Tish and falls in love with her and ends up marrying her. So when the book opens, we have all of these people working in the same building, in the same office, in the same business, and they're celebrating the launch of the IPO of the company. So that's where it starts. And I know, I know it seems like a cliche with the um, new younger wife, <laughs> the new model, and then the older um, or the original, I guess, wife. So that's I wanted to kind of take that notion at a family business, which is very fraught with um, dysfunction in most cases, and then kind of stir all that together and see what happened. The um, you know when you when you're looking at the book, the uh, the description really. Um, it kind of sets off the um, uh, kind of sets your 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 brain on fire as you imagine. You know, Kate Nelson had it all, but Tish Nelson has it all. Um, <laughs> tell me about these two characters and the the uh, you know, how they differ and and you know juxtaposing this kind of idyllic life with with the two of them. Yeah, I mean, it it really is. It's kind of. Um, I look at Kate, she's given up a lot to make the business a success. She thinks she has, she's kind of a control freak. So she thinks she has everything under control in her life until this divorce happens, until all of a sudden John decides to leave her. That just wasn't part of the plan. (laughs) So she's going to do everything possible to make sure that the company survives and thrives, even with this distraction. And also, I think she would say that she also wants to make a point of making John realize he might have made a mistake. (laughs) So that's kind of her motivations in the book. And then Tish is totally the opposite of Kate. She didn't really ever see herself working in a corporate environment, but she, you know, decided that it sounded good being the executive assistant to like one of the biggest companies in Columbus, Ohio. She thought that would be a fun job. It wasn't really like she was looking to find love there, but she once she met John, she thought that could be a possibility too. So she's more of an opportunistic person. I mean, she's very funny and very street smart. So she's not to be underestimated either. So it sets these two women up for a very um, strong cat and mouse game, let's say. Well, it's fun to um, – when you've got a book like this, you kind of automatically assume there's there's a, a good guy and a bad guy, um, you know, to, to just use cliches like that. And and we're uh, – you know, whether we want to or not, you know, in the first few chapters of the book, we're trying to figure out um, kind of where our our allegiances lie. Um, you know, who which character do we – um, relate to and which one are, are we pulling for and what you love to do Kara is to to make us question our allegiances and and you know whose side am I on and whose side do I need to be on um, is it something that that you have fun with when you're writing you know making making us question our choices all along the way Oh, yeah, I love that. I love that. Because you do, you have this whole art culturally defined, you know, the first wife's the victim and, you know, all all of that. So, I mean, I think you naturally have um, sympathy for Kate, as you maybe should, because she's the woman scorned, right? But perhaps there's another woman scorned, too. So, um, I mean, that's where the fun lies, because if I was just writing a typical book then it might be better suited for romance as you know if there wasn't any questioning of character or unreliableness about the characters then it could be just a straightforward love story gone wrong for example or in women's fiction it could just be about a struggle to build build a business and you know all of that and more of the family dynamics but that's not really where suspense lies (laughs) you've mentioned a couple times the unreliable narrator or unreliable character um how how important is it to you when you're kind of sketching characters and 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 learning them and and you know bringing them to the page um that you you keep us guessing you you know you make us question uh, if a person is who we think they are and and what sort of exercises do you go through to kind of learn who the characters are for you so that you can then you know play with us and play with our emotions Right. I, you know, and I will say I, I'm a historically notorious pantser, but my agents are teaching me how to become a light outliner <laughs> just so they can keep up with where I'm going. So I will say I've found 
a little bit of value in outlining. I'll just put that in there. So, and then as part of that whole scenario, I'm also starting to do little character sketches, which I never did before. I just kind of, they kind of popped into my head and then they would unfold as the story unfolded. So right now, what I will do, this is not really to answer your unreliability nature, because I'll know who's reliable and who's not before I even put, start putting them on the page in my mind. But as far as their descriptions and all that kind of thing, I've started looking at People Magazine and ripping people out. <laughs> That's who I'll <laughs> use. That was a little trick I used. Um, they taught me in the romance world. So I've taken that with me into this world and it's really fun. So I'll be surrounded by pictures of my characters. But as far as their personalities, I kind of get to know them as they tell their story, if that makes sense, in the pantser world. Yeah. Um, do, do you know where the book is going from the beginning? Like, do you, do you know that final twist at the end? Yes. You, well, usually I know who's going to die, <laughs> but I don't necessarily know how or when. So I, yeah, so that that's interesting because each book is different in that regard. So I'm thinking back to different scenes and I think in best day ever, I knew that, I knew how that was going to end, like the final scene of that. And I also knew in the favorite daughter, the fine. I, so I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. I do know the beginning and the end, but I don't know exactly how it all happens or unfolds. Well, the new book is The Next Wife. And when you're hearing this, it's available everywhere. Um, I know that The Next Wife was um, a... Uh, an early re release for uh, for Amazon Prime members, and a whole lot of people got to read the book and and uh, got to leave early feedback. Um, I, I would imagine that is uh, a a what, it, what it's no doubt that's a gift to writers to to have that uh, that Amazon machine behind you. Uh, but that's probably a little terrifying too to have an early early release like that, isn't it? I, well, I found it really fun. <laughs> Personally, I, uh, you know, my, uh, I self published, so I've been small press published, traditionally published, and now I'm with the Amazon publishing. And there's the benefits to each different platform and way of going about publishing. But my self published books, you self publish through Amazon, at least I did. And so it was always about looking at the numbers and you could see real time and refreshing and looking at the number of reviews. And now with, Amazon first read selection it's been amazing like I you know like wait that's another hundred reviews in an hour that's crazy <laughs> I mean just having that many people have a chance to read it and love it or hate it is great so also I've learned in my um, now over a de decade of doing this is to try not to read the ugly first mean reviews so I'm trying to skip over the royal whatever her name is <laughs> first reviewer <laughs> not that i don't know who you are and then um, move to the happy five star because you can sort by five star reviews so oh yeah yeah so that's where i like to hang out if i'm checking but it's been such a gift i i just can't um imagine being able in another platform to be able to get your story into so many people's hands you know for for all of the um uh, the downsides of technology and and all the stuff that we've been through, you have to admit that uh, this is one of the the definite upsides. Oh, for sure. And I'm a paper book reader. I love my local bookstore, and I love supporting indie bookstores and reading. You know, like the smell of paper and the feel of a real book. So don't get me wrong. I'm I'm a traditionalist when it comes to that. But people love their Kindles and they love access and and to be able to take a book anywhere with you you know it once we all get traveling again and have a stack of books lined up in your kindle that's that's so fun absolutely uh well the new book the next wife is available everywhere now when you're hearing this uh kara if if people uh, are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do where can they find you online I am at kararuda.com, and it's a lot of vowels, so it's K-A-I-R-A-R-O-U-D-A.com. And I'm also on Instagram and Facebook at Kararuda Books and Twitter and, you know, everywhere that you can at Kararuda. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're going to put links to uh, all of that in the show notes to help people find you. Kara, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. It's been great talking to you, too. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. 
Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com. Are you looking for software that helps you bring your novel to life? Novelize is a web-based writing app which allows you to access your work on any device with a browser and an internet connection. Write from your desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Just get the novel written. Say goodbye to sticky notes. With our notebook on the side, you can keep track of all the important information you need to write your novel. We keep distractions to a minimum, help you track your progress, and encourage you to write more novels. You can even use the same notebook for your novels in a series. Outline, write, or organize your novel by switching between modes. You can write your outline notes while you're writing, and you can move scenes and chapters around anytime in the organize mode. Choose between the dark and light theme to help prevent eye strain so that you can stay immersed in your book. Novelize. The app for writers by writers.